it's a, indeed a, a privilege and an honor to be able to uh, speak here on this last Sunday of the year. Uh, we've been through the life of David all fall long, which is kind of strange to hear my name every single Sunday. Uh, uh, when we got to the uh, uh, Bathsheba part, I said, could you say King David rather than David caught in adultery? Uh, and then two weeks ago, Pastor Greg said, uh, I'm gonna be speaking today on the last words of David. And I thought, oh man, he just took my sermon title. That's, that's terrible. Uh, these are, in fact, the last words of David as a staff member here at uh, Houston's First Baptist Church. And I, I you know, would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that 51 years in ministry, 26 years at this church, and then three years at this church back when I was in college, so a total of 29 years. That doesn't happen in a vacuum. I have many spiritual mentors. Uh, pastor Greg and I were considering this morning, I've served with him longer than any pastor in my ministry, and we've become great friends. He is a servant, he's humble, he's provided great leadership. We have wonderful staff that have come alongside. Diane Bagby has been my executive assistant for 17, uh, all 17 of the years since Pastor Greg's been here and uh, really cleaned up a lot of my messes, as have many of you deacons, many of you Sunday school leaders, and many of you friends, and I thank you for it. Um, I'm very pleased that Dr. Stephen Trammell is gonna be taking over this role, very well qualified, good friend of mine. Uh, please pray for Dr. Trammell and Tanya, and uh, I know it'll, it'll be great. Well, let me just say from the beginning, I know that we have two distinct congregations listening to me today, all right? Even in person and online, we've got the one congregation that is the most committed. Here you are, the day after Christmas, when everyone on television is telling you you're gonna die if you get outside the doors of your house. And here you are, committed in God's house, worshiping God, listening to God's messenger. I appreciate you so much. But I would be foolish if I didn't realize and acknowledge the fact that some of you are here against your will, okay? You didn't realize that when you took grandma up on a Christmas dinner, that there was a package deal involved that you needed to go with grandma to church, whether you're worshiping online or you're here in the deal. And, and so kind of like outwardly you're here, but inwardly you're sitting there with your arms crossed going, I don't wanna be here. Whether you're here by choice or you're here by coercion, let me suggest you're not here by accident. I'm gonna share with you four things that have become extremely controversial, unfortunately, in church world. Things that, uh, I mean, we live in a very divisive society, right? If you were to go on social media this afternoon and say, I love chickens, the comments would be like, what have you got against ducks? You know, I mean, everyone is gonna take a contrarian view of whatever position is put out there. So when I was ordained 51 years ago, these were, totally accepted, these four things, totally accepted in the body of Christ, totally accepted at Houston's First. In fact, I could not have been ordained had I not said, yes, these four things are true. Today, the body of Christ is split. About half on any one of these subjects would take a contrarian view. And so my last time to speak to you, I just simply wanted to say, to double down on four things I know to be true. Won't you stand? Uh, I oftentimes when I preached, I would stand in honor of reading God's word. I got that from an African-American pastor who did that with his congregation every, every Sunday. We don't do it every Sunday, but this last time around, let's stand in honor of reading God's word. Second Corinthians, uh, excuse me, Second Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture, is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You may be seated and may God honor the reading of his word. Four things I wanna share with you real quickly. Um, I wanna start with a question. The question is one that's used as a diagnostic within the evangelism explosion ministry. I've asked this question to thousands of people in virtually every state of the union and many foreign countries. And the question is this, but I want you to not just take it as theoretical. I want you to really answer this question yourself. Suppose you were to die today. Now, a lot of people two years ago would have said that question is archaic. Nobody thinks about death anymore. Now everybody thinks about death. In fact, this last year, our results 
our, our tangible results, the uh, reported results from our training clinics have basically doubled over what they've ever been before. More people want to hear the gospel. More people want to say yes to Jesus because death is something we hear about every single day. Suppose you were to die today. You stand before God. He were to say, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Think about that for a second. I found that generally responses fall in two broad categories. Overwhelmingly, a non-church person would say something like, well, you know, I try to live a good life, try to obey the Ten Commandments, try to do the best I can. And the idea there is that God grades on a curve. You know, I, I don't have to be perfect. I just have to be better than my brother-in-law, right? I, I just, it's like the two guys, uh, the jungle explorers, they got chased by a lion. And one of them said, you don't think you can outrun the lion? He goes, no, I don't have to outrun the lion. I just have to outrun you. And, and so there are many people out there who feel like uh, as long as I'm in the 51% of good works, I'm gonna make it. Sure I will. But you know, the bad news is God does not grade on a curve. The Bible says there is no one righteous, no, not one. It says, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Uh, by the works of flesh is no one justified. And therefore, the one group of responses that I hear overwhelmingly, you know, I'm a good person. I can get there because of what I do. Uh, it's absolutely wrong. Uh, so the first point in your listening guide, if you're taking notes, salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, you say, well, how's that controversial, David? A recent Barna survey of churchgoers found evangelical Christians, not just churchgoers, those who self-describe as evangelical, 48% felt like getting to heaven was a matter of good works. 48%. So again, what was universally accepted by the church, that it's salvation is faith alone in Christ alone. Now people go, no, I think I can earn my way there. Well, let me give you the reasons you cannot earn your way to heaven, all right? Five things, real quickly. Number one, heaven is consistently described in the Bible as a free gift. For by grace are you saved, Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Um, for by grace are you saved through faith. That's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Gift, not of works lest anyone should boast. Um, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Um, God lives in a holy heaven, a perfect heaven. He, he is sinless. He cannot tolerate to look upon sin. And so heaven can only be given as a gift because we're sinners and God has to punish sin. He loves us, but he has to punish sin. And so God reconciled the problem in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus lived a perfect life, showed that it could be done, and then he died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins and he's alive today in heaven, which he offers as a free gift. You say, well, David, that's, you know, that's Christianity 101. I've learned that since the third grade. That's nothing new at all. And yet, Billy Graham said, the majority of people attending church on Sunday morning have no idea whether they're going to go to heaven or not. What a sad situation. My friend Jim in Oklahoma, um, I knew him as an adult. He was a deacon in the church. He was a Sunday school teacher in the church. He, he was a bank president in the community. Um, when the church chose by election a group of people to be on the pastor search committee, Jim was one of them. And yet to my astonishment, he came down the aisle one Sunday morning and said, I am lost. I am not going to heaven. I've never had uh, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I, I just had to say, how on earth? And he said, you know, fell out a card as a young boy, baptized, got involved in Sunday school, earned all of my pins, did everything, checked all the boxes that everyone said I needed to check, learned all the lingo, got ordained as a deacon. And I begin to, in my pride, think, if I don't go to heaven, there's nobody gonna go to heaven. Look at who I am. I had a guy one time, I said, what would you say to God? He said, what would heaven be without me? And that was kind of Jim's thought, you know? Jim thought, well, what would heaven be without me? If I don't go, nobody's gonna go. 
The problem was he never had transferred his trust to Jesus Christ for his salvation. Jim was wanting to be his own savior. He felt like by being good enough, giving enough money, serving enough leadership positions, God would be forced to take him into heaven. Untrue. That's absolutely untrue. There's only one way to get into heaven, and that is through faith alone in Christ alone. You say, well, you know, David, I, I believe in I believe in God, I, I believe in Jesus, I believe the, the Bible is the only way. Great, you've got what's called head knowledge. You, you, you have the basic facts, but that head knowledge has to make an 18 inch journey from your head to your heart. And you have to do what the Bible says, you have to stop just putting your trust on God. Well, God's in heaven, God's gonna take care of it. You've gotta put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You have to transfer your trust. And so when I asked you that question earlier, if any part of your answer had to do with, you know, I try to do a good, good deeds, I, I give money to the church. If I is involved in that, then you're trying to be your own savior. And I, I implore you in my last sermon at this church, get it settled today. What, what do we live, 80 years on this earth? 90 years, 100 years? What's eternity? It's forever and ever, and it's heaven or hell. This is not something that you want to leave to the last moment. Get it settled today. Salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. It requires a transfer of your trust from the good works that you do to Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Second thing I would submit to you is that truth is based on God's word. Now, I wrestle with myself about how to state this. It could well be stated God's word is truth or truth is God's word, all of those are true. But I wanted to contrast the idea of what people are trusting in for truth in today's society. That same Barna survey that I mentioned uh, revealed that 75% of people believe that most people are generally good. Well, that's not what the Bible says. It said there's no, none righteous, no, not one. Uh, it, it 61% don't read the Bible daily. 60% of those respondents, and these are, again, evangelical, church-going people, 60% said, if the Bible teaches something that disagrees with my beliefs, I choose my beliefs. So that's where we are now in the Christian life. We, we've gotten to be uh, the contrast between your truth and my truth and everybody's is relatively equal and anybody can be right. And as long as they sincerely believe in what they believe, then everything's hunky-dory. And that's not just not what the Bible says at all. In fact, David Burton did a, um, by a blog recently and, and he said, Satan's first attack against God was one of deception. In the garden to Eve, has God truly said? And so Satan is known as a liar and the father of lies. Uh, his deception is focused on creating doubt in people's minds. The doubt leads to diminishing God's character and ultimately in dishonoring God's holiness. People in today's society in America, many people even in the church, they no longer fear God they don't even respect God. They don't even acknowledge God. A recent poll in Australia found that a majority of the adult population in Australia don't believe Jesus Christ was a historical figure. Now that's basic research. That's just a matter of, you're not gonna find anyone that studied it that would believe that, but that's just, that's my truth. I just don't believe Jesus ever lived. End of story. I'm gonna go move on. Rich Volod is a, a pastor in Brooklyn. He has a multi-ethnic congregation there. It's estimated 75 different countries are represented in Rich's uh, congregation. He recently posted, he said, when Jesus was tempted, outflowed scripture. When Jesus was challenged, outflowed scripture. When Jesus was crucified, outflowed scripture. If you wanna be like Jesus, ingest scripture, memorize scripture, internalize scripture to the point that when you are cut, out flows scripture. We need to be people of the word and we need to be committed to the veracity of God's word. The third thing I would say is that our mission, excuse me, life's purpose is to glorify God. It's to glorify God. And, and you know, of all the things I've said, this would probably be the least controversial. You know, you're not gonna get a lot of people going, no, that's not right, we're not supposed to glorify God. 
However, they want to define those terms the way they want to define them. And so I've put four things in your listening guide that are mentioned in the Bible as uh, being ways of glorifying God. The first is worship and praise, and we certainly accept that. I mean, we call them worship services, right? We sing hymns and spiritual songs and psalms, and we, we lift up our voices to God. I don't think anybody debates whether worship and praise is a way of glorifying God. My suggestion is it's only one way of glorifying God. A second way of glorifying God is through our good works. Um, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, let me connect a couple of dots for you. Preschool workers, vacation Bible school laborers, people that go on mission trips, people that will labor in the, the, the uh, food closet, food pantry, faith centers, those that are ushers here at the church. I mean, I could go on and on. Those, those poor, betraggled parking lot attendants that have everybody yell at them every Sunday morning, why can't I park here? Those people, okay, they don't hear people glorifying God. But God said that's gonna be the ultimate result of your good works. When you give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, it's not just that you're slacking someone's thirst. That's a good thing. But I think we have put good works into the realm of as long as I'm helping someone, then, then that's valid. No, it's valid if you're doing it in God's name, if you're doing it for Christ's purpose and his glory. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. They may never write you a note of appreciation. You may never have a David Self Day on the platform where everybody makes a big deal about you. You may labor in obscurity for 51 years. God knows, and you are, through your labor, through your service, you are in fact glorifying God. The, 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 the third is unity. Unity glorifies God. Uh, I've got a long verse in, uh, in Romans, I think it is, that, that supports that. Uh, you, you, with one voice and one mind, uh, worship your Father and therefore glorify His name. Through our unity, Jesus said, they'll know your disciples because of your love one for another. So our unity actually glorifies God. Um, unity, though, uh, gets crazy definitions. Uh, a lot of people think unity is union. Union. We've all got to be in the same place at the same time. Um, that's why you, you have life Bible studies, when, when the idea comes up that, you know, you could create another life Bible study, you could have a daughter class, people just, no, we will not be unified if we're not in the same room with the same teacher at the same time. Okay, um, that's not unity. That's not what the Bible says unity is. But do you realize if we use that definition that it's uni union, that we would never have multi-site campuses. We, we'd never have more than one life Bible study. We, we would never have... Uh, uh, multiple worship services at the church. Uh, that is based on the fact that we can be unified without all being in the same place at the same time. Unity is not uniformity. And that's another tremendously uh, misappropriated term because people think, well, we've got to do the same thing in the same way with, with each other. We've all got to look the same, act the same, read the same version of scripture, uh, on and on and on and on. But, but that's not what we read in the Bible. There was a kind of a famous deacons meeting back before Pastor Greg came. And uh, this is back during the days of worship wars. Thank goodness we, we don't have those anymore. But it's like a deacon stood up before a deacon body and introduced a resolution to be voted upon that, and I'm simplifying this, in one particular service, the service he attended, we would only have the kind of music he liked. That's basically what it, and he had a compatriot that seconded the motion, so now we had a floor debate. It was heated. It was uh, emotional. Uh, I think it was Malcolm Morris that said, uh, he came to me, he said, do we need to call paramedics? <laughs> These guys are getting, you know, they're getting the vapors. They're getting red in the face, and, uh, you know, we may have some guys have a heart attack here. And I remember Ernie Wales, dear, dear deacon, uh, we served together at a downtown location, Ernie stood up and he said, gentlemen, he said, let's take a step back and approach this from God's perspective. He said, God loves unity, no question about it, but he applauds diversity. He didn't create just one kind of flowers. We've got roses and daisies and on and on orchids. He didn't create one kind of dog. It's just on and on and on. He loves diversity. He loves diversity in his creation. 
And Paul said very clearly in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, we're a part of one body, but we're not all hands. We, we don't all have to look like feet or ears. We all have different expressions and different ministries, but we can be unified within the body. Thankfully, Ernie carried the day that day, and um, our services look the way they look today in a large part because our, church, our, our deacons had a really firm grasp on what unity is. It's not uniformity. It's not unanimity. We don't have to have Cyprus do everything the way Siena does or the Loop do things the way downtown does. We can uh, have a methodology as long as our mission remains the same. And that leads us to our fourth uh, point of glorifying God. What is unity in the body? It's visible cooperation and communicating the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, and Jesus said that very clearly. Herein is my Father glorified in that you bear much fruit. Now, some people have trivialized that and said, well, the fruit is the fruit of the Spirit and love and joy and peace. I'm, I'm going to argue with you about that. However, I would say he's speaking to a basic agrarian society who would understand his phrase that a fig tree reproduces figs and a olive tree reproduces olives. And therefore a disciple reproduces other disciples. A Christian reproduces other Christians. And so we glorify God as we reproduce disciples throughout the globe, which brings us to our final point. Is, aren't those welcome words on a Sunday morning? Our final point, and that is our mission remains unchanged. Our mission remains unchanged. Um, Pastor Greg mentioned uh, some of the things I'm going to be doing in retirement. You know, uh, I've heard it described as uh, uh, twice the husband, half the income. Uh, I, but I want you to know my vocation is changing in terms of a paid staff member. My mission is not changing. As he mentioned, I was very privileged. Uh, not only are y'all paying for this Israel uh, EE clinic, but uh, the president of EE at our last board meeting asked me to teach it. So Bonnie and I are going to be flying over there sometime probably early May, late June. And a group of evangelical pastors uh, in Israel have invited us to come in and equip them for evangelism. Very honored to do that. Had you asked me back in October, September, David, what does a retirement look like? I would have never, I mean, I could have listed a thousand things and teaching a clinic in Israel would have not have been one of them. But my mission remains unchanged, right? Uh, on February, we will celebrate the 60th anniversary of Evangelism Explosion. That's going to take place at D. James Kennedy's uh, original church that he founded, Core Ridge Presbyterian Church. And the pastor there has invited me to preach that sermon on Sunday morning, the 60th anniversary sermon of Evangelism Explosion. Tremendously honored. I would have never been able to plan that in advance. But if my mission remains the same, then I'm ready for those opportunities when they come up. Back in the day, uh, we've always had a parking problem at this church, no question about it. Before Pastor Greg came, uh, John Bazzagno came to me and he said, okay, I want you to uh, uh, create 300 offsite parkers. I think at the time we had eight, okay? He said, I want you to get 300 people motivated to park offsite. And I said, okay, I'll accept the challenge, but you have to understand leadership has to set the tone. I'll do that as long as the staff, the deacons, and the Sunday school leadership are all asked to park off site. And you're going to have to do that. He goes, okay, I'll do that. But I've got a condition. I said, what's that? He said, you're going to become my shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> and literally for a year and a half, I drove up to his home on Big Hollow Drive, I think it is, uh, out by Wilcrest, drove up at 730 he walked out, Bible in hand, suit, all that kind of stuff, gets in my car, I drive him to the church, we get to the church about 10 to 8, and then at 8.15 he preaches the first of three sermons. That went for, well, just like clockwork, for a year and a half. It was, it was great. Until the day that I drove up in front of his house and he came out in his bathrobe and house slippers. I rolled down the window and I said, what's up? And he said, I'm sick, you're preaching three times today. Turned on his heel, walked back to the house. True story. So, you know, I had to not only think of a sermon that I could preach. I mean, Pastor Greg probably spends 
20 hours preparing a sermon. I had less than 20 minutes. So I had to think of a sermon I had preached before, but not at Houston's First Baptist Church and that I could do with little or no preparation at all. And I preached about our, our mission because the Bible says, be instant in season and out of season. Be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks for a hope that's within you. That's just a part of who I am and that's gonna continue retirement or no retirement. I'm going to be carrying out that mission. I wanna show you a picture. Uh, Pastor Greg talked about evangelism explosion. This was the fourth Congress that we had. Uh, Bonnie and I have been privileged to go to all four of them. Uh, the first one, Kuala Lumpur, second in Cape Town, South Africa, the third one in Indonesia. This one was in Tirana, Albania. In each one, we've gone from 28 multiplying countries up to almost 100 in this, uh, in this particular photo. We'll have another Congress in uh, 2023 um, that will uh, be over 100 multiplying nations. A multiplying nation with evangelism explosion means they have their own board of directors, their own paid national director, they raise their own support in country, they publish their own materials, and they are working with other countries and in, in creating these training opportunities and bringing them to multiplying status. What it means is that they become self-supporting independent entities. And if everything collapses within the U.S., EE Romania would continue, EE South Korea, EE Indonesia, EE Philippines. All of these are self-supporting, self-governing organizations. Uh, our, his, his, uh, his, um, our, our slogan has been, his last command, our first concern. And, and that's what we're trying to do is share the gospel throughout the world. Do you realize that's the mission statement of our church? We don't have any Harvard Business School, three-point PowerPoint, mission statement. It's the scripture. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. That's your mission statement. That's my mission statement. Every dollar that we spend as a church is tied back to that mission statement. Every staff member we hire, every program we initiate, all tied back to that mission statement. And so the question is, what are you doing about this mission that has remained unchanged. And I have to say to you, COVID has not been kind to us in the area of personal evangelism. The idea of talking with someone and sharing the gospel, I mean, we've got masks, we're self-quarantined. I mean, even inviting someone to church, the thought comes to our mind, are we killing this person? You know, am I gonna bring them to church and they're gonna be infected and die and it's all gonna be my fault? And so Satan plays these mind games with us to discourage us from ever doing what the main thing is. That's one thing. And we're going to have to find a way around that. As I said, our results, our, our reported results within Evangelism Explosion this year have doubled. And they've doubled for two reasons. Number one, more people are concerned about dying than ever before. And so when you ask someone, suppose you were to die today, you get their attention. They want to hear what you say. Secondly, we have used um, electronic media, Zoom conversations. I, I, I get the privilege of hearing these sort of things that a guy in Finland is, is FaceTiming live with someone in the Mideast and sharing the gospel. I'm hearing that someone in the Philippines is talking to someone in Indonesia, and someone in Indonesia is talking to someone on mainland China, and we're seeing twice the results that we've ever seen in any other year. Folks, I just submit to you, the fields are white unto harvest. So I think COVID's one problem. I, I think the second problem is we have lost sight of the power of God. We have bought into the philosophical construct of those 18th century, 19th century skeptics who said, it's all about science. It's all about logic. God's not gonna do anything in this world that we can't understand logically or we can't explain by science. And so it totally destroys the idea of the miraculous. There are no healings. Uh, you know, the problem is, as Lee Strobel said in his wonderful book, I, I recommend this book to you, The Case for Miracles, 2014 book. He said, the problem is we base our whole faith on a miracle. Jesus Christ died three days in the tomb. Now he's risen again. That's the basis of our whole faith. If we accept that God entered into uh, human history to raise Jesus from the dead, why do we have so much trouble with thinking that he can change someone's life? 
And, and in our minds, we argue with ourselves that what good is it for me to witness to my brother-in-law because my brother-in-law is stubborn and I could never talk him into the kingdom of God. Ladies and gentlemen, your job is not to talk someone into the kingdom of God, not to argue anyone into being a spiritual person. Your responsibility, this mission that's remained unchanged, is to share the gospel clearly and completely and allow the Holy Spirit to work his power in the person convicting of sin, convincing the Holy Spirit uh, truth. There are some of you listening to me right now, maybe at home on, on, on uh, YouTube or, or here in the, the worship service, and you, you feel this kind of prickly sensation in, in your spirit, and you go, oh, something's going on here. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Did I have bad pizza last night? I, I just feel different about this. It may be the Holy Spirit is drawing you, and you need to pay attention to what he's saying and talk to someone this very day. God's powerful. God does things that we don't understand. And I'll close with this last illustration. John Sorensen, as Pastor Greg said, is the president, uh, president and uh, CEO of Evangelism Explosion. And part of that job is always to raise money. Everybody that's a CEO of a nonprofit, they're always making calls, always making visits, always trying to raise money because it is a nonprofit. It's dependent upon uh, uh, you know, uh, gifts. Um, and, and I'm so appreciative serving on the board of EE to hear about the gift to, to sponsor this clinic in Israel. On average this last year for every dollar given to EE, two people have come to know Christ somewhere around the world. That means $26,000, that's 52,000 people potentially, not necessarily in Israel, but somewhere around the world coming to Jesus. John uh, made such a call to uh, a donor in Denver. Uh, the donor is not a heavy hitter. He, he gave, John said, less than $100 a year, but he had done it faithfully over the years. And John wanted to just call and see how he could pray for him. And he asked him that question over the phone. And the guy said, you know, I do have a request. Uh, I have a tremendous burden of my heart right now. My sister's been in ICU for a couple of weeks. She's lost consciousness. She's in a coma. And I don't know if she's going to heaven or not. We've talked about it before. We've never gotten to a point of decision. And John, I'm not even sure that physical healing is in God's plan for her. She's had a long degenerative illness. I would be happy to see her relief from this life, release from this life of pain. If I knew for sure she was going to heaven, would you pray that? John prayed with the man over the phone. I don't know if it was that evening or the next morning. The man called him back. He said, John, shortly after our prayer, I got a call from the hospital. They said, amazingly, your sister's awake. She's conscious. She's, she is asking for you. And the man went to his sister in the hospital and he said, she wanted to make sure she knew she was going to heaven. And he said, I walked her through grace, man, God, Christ, faith. We got to the point of prayer. She prayed and asked Jesus to come into her heart. He said, I can't tell you, John, the joy I felt hearing her say those words. And John, one hour later, she went into eternity. She died. God gave him that chance. And of course, the question is, and I talked to someone after the first service, he said, tears came to my eyes because he said, my brother's in ICU. My brother's in a coma. I'm praying for that. And as Lee Strobel said in his book, the problem we have with miracles is if we accept that they can happen, why aren't they happening to me? And I don't know, God's sovereign, God's loving, God's powerful. All I know is we're to act in faith and leave the results to him. Four things I know. I know salvation's by faith. And if you're not trusting Jesus today, you can get that right at the invitation time. I know that truth is based on God's word. And if we're following some other system of determining what truth is, we're gonna be led in error. Thirdly, unity is the goal uh, and unity expressed within the body. The final thing is our mission remains unchanged. It's to go into all the world, share the gospel with every person and leave the results to God because God will be with us even to the end of the age. It's been my privilege to share these four things with you. I pray that you would take them to heart. If you need to have a response today, we have people that would be more than happy to talk to you. Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you so much for this great church, this pastor, the leadership, the staff, all they've met in my life, Father. Uh, my heart's just overflowed right now with gratitude for this opportunity to serve in this great place. Father, help us not to just walk away from these four truths, but to really examine how we are holding on to them, holding up for them, standing for truth, standing for salvation, standing for unity, standing for your mission. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.